What's up, champs? Welcome to another episode of the Keeping Carlson and Short Shifts Fantasy Hockey Podcast. I'm your host, Louis Ezekiel. Joining me tonight, my friend and yours, Jeremy Versillo. Jeremy, how are you doing this fine, fine Tuesday evening? I'm doing great. Uh, I actually am still at the office. I snagged a conference room for this just because things got busy and I forgot to drive home before we recorded this. Hey, right on. Uh, I also have been running around like crazy. I'm trying to get back into athletics and I have soccer on Fridays and volleyball on Tuesdays now. So I'm like fresh out of the shower, really sore, but are ready to get started here. Uh, So let's dive right into it. we got plenty to talk about here. We are going to be like Nick Paul after six hitless games. We're going to bring you all the hits all at once. Uh, So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, And the person I want to talk to first is Matthew Nyes, uh, who was deployed on the top line for Toronto. Uh, A great opportunity. I think they released the lines on Sunday uh, for the game on Monday. He got a goal and two assists, two shots and two hits on line one with Matthews and Marner. Uh, His 15.37 of ice time was 30 seconds more than his season high and about two minutes more than his season average to that point. Only got about 30 seconds of power play time on ice, but that top line was responsible for four even strength goals in that big comeback after being down 4-1 to to winning 6-5 in OT. Kelly Yarncroke was the other big winner scoring the overtime goal and he had another one in there as well. Uh, It's hard to see that line changing in the near future and with games left on light days, Wednesday, Friday this week. Is this a guy that people should be running out to grab as long as that deployment lasts? He's a pedigree guy that people have been excited for for a while. Now he's getting a chance to produce. I know we had quite the heated debate in the short shifts chat. Um, What what did you take away from all that, Jeremy? Well, my takeaway was that Matthew Nyes is great while he's on that line, but I don't know how long he's going to be there. Toronto has kind of always rotated their top line third wheel. Uh, it's just, you know, a spot that whoever's hot goes there. Nice is also young, so he's more likely to need some rest as the season gets later. The one thing I will say in his favor, on top of him obviously being a high-end prospect, he plays the type of game that complements Matthews and Marner very well. He gets to the dirty places. He uh, One of his goal or his goal was cleaning up the garbage in front of the net. And I think that can really improve Matthews and Barner's game by having someone like that on their line so they can do the fancy stuff and pass and shoot. And Nice is just there wreaking havoc. Yeah, I'm into that. And, you know, I, I agree with you that he could certainly be shuffled down at any time and definitely stay tuned to gamedaytweets.com. You can search Nyes by name, you can search by team, and just check out Toronto stuff. But I have to imagine after the success of the last game, at least the relative success after a kind of rough start, uh, that he's at least going to get another game up there. Um, So while he's got that light game schedule, I'm into it. He is someone that I'm kind of eyeballing to potentially drop late in the week. Uh, If I need, you know, he's not going to fit on in on Saturday. you know, so he is a guy that I'm certainly willing to let go of and just say thank you for your service. But at least for those Wednesday, Friday games, I'm going to hope I can keep him in the lineup and that he will stay atop uh, the lineup for the Leafs. Uh, another big piece of news from today, Jack Campbell was put on waivers uh, for assignment uh, to get some work, get his game back uh, down at a, the lower level. Um what do you think this means for the future of the crease? Is it you know time to run out and grab Skinner? Is he going to be the volume starter here? I, I say that very hesitantly because he kind of freaks me out. But uh, what are you thinking with the Edmonton goaltending, which obviously has been a source up spot this season? I would definitely be grabbing Skinner in any league. He's on the wire. I know both goalies have been bad, so he may have been dropped. The other two options they could bring up are... Uh, Our old friend Calvin Pickard, who has a 2.0 goals against average and a 9.39 save percentage in four games with their AHL affiliate, or Olivia Rodrigo, I mean, Oliver Rodrigue, who's a rookie who's only played two games but has a 1.0 goals against average and a 9.68 save percentage. Uh, What could go wrong calling up a rookie to fix all your problems? That's a bad idea, right? Yeah, sure. We don't even know if he's got his driver's license, right? <laughs> uh, so, 
Uh, not great, but I'm trying here. Um, yeah, you know, I, I'm with you. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Cal Pickard get into a game. Um, I think that probably is the better way to go. I think uh, I think relying on on the rookie to to solve everything, like you said, is probably not a path to success. Uh, so I would maybe try to avoid that. But you know, uh, give me whoever has you know on Thursday if you've got an open spot. I know it's a busy day, but whoever is uh, playing goalie against the Sharks, never bad to stream that player. I think pretty much until things get figured out or there's a coaching change and they get some kind of system going uh, in San Jose. You know, streaming someone against the Sharks is almost like getting two games from anybody else. So uh, we'll we'll talk about. It. I actually made a drop today to get a guy in uh, from the Flyers to play the Sharks tonight. So. Uh, you, you can tell me if you think I was crazy or if I if I made an all right choice here. Speaking of the Flyers and of goaltending, uh, let's talk about Sam Erson. I gave him a hard time. Erson, sorry, I don't know which it is. Um, but I gave him a hard time on Thursday. And, of course, he went out and had a great game against Buffalo, allowing one goal on 22 shots. Uh, now that I've mentioned him, you know, he's going to be the first, you know, he'll allow the, the Sharks to score three goals for just the second time this season. You know, it's just that kind of, uh, it's, you talk them up and then you get the curse. But that game will be wrapped up tonight. We'll kind of see how it goes. Um, but, you know, uh, good on him. And and as Elon said in our, you know, we're here in the Discord chat and he popped in to, to say hi. And he pointed out, you know, this is a guy who had some success last year. He's not like a, a legendary choke artist. He just had that really ugly start to the season. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I know a number of people grabbed him to play him against the Sharks tonight. Not a bad idea. We'll see how that one turns out. But, yeah, he did pretty nicely. Um, let's head on over to our injuries and outcheries. I know you've got an important update uh, on the Carolina goaltending situation. So, Jeremy, why don't you take us through what's going on down in Raleigh? Really unfortunate. The Hurricanes have announced that Freddie Anderson is out indefinitely with a blood clotting issue. All the best to Freddie, and I believe I saw somewhere that it is not life-threatening or career-ending, but it's something that needs to be addressed and requires some time off. So they called up uh, Peter Kachekov, and Antti Ranta is starting, or started today's game, where I believe he got an overtime win. I got to imagine this is going to be close to a 50-50, Ranta's pretty old. It would be hard to run him too far into the ground. Do you have interest in either of these Canes goalies, assuming it's a 50-50? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to stay away from the 50-50s in general, maybe for a spot start here and there. Carolina, as always, kind of the pattern for them is that their goalies only face maybe 22, 25 shots. So if you let in a couple goals, it's usually not all that valuable. Uh, But it might be worth taking a look at. Um, nothing that I'm looking to grab, you know, for any kind of long-term hold. And, you know, we saw last year, neither Ranta nor Kochetkov really was able to hold on to, um, really able to hold on to that spot. So, no, I'm not especially interested in either. No more interested than I was, especially in Freddie and Ranta when they kind of both were there. And I know they haven't been splitting starts the way that, um, you know, they had at times uh, previously, but Still, still not ideal. Um, and of course, we, have, we wish Freddie all the best uh, as we focus on the fantasy value here. My pro tip for some of those 50-50s is keep an eye when their team plays a Thursday, Saturday, Sunday type of schedule where you can pick up whoever plays the Thursday game and then guarantee they get one of the back-to-backs. So you get two starts in four days from a guy who's probably on the wire. You can do that with San Jose goalies, Montreal goalies, depending on the league, um, Arizona goalies may both be on the wire. Or if a backup starts the singular game and then has a back-to-back coming up, you can kind of sneak a couple extra starts in there if you pay attention. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. And it's, it's yeah, smart definitely to kind of play play those chances. You know, unlikely, obviously, especially in a situation like that, that you're going to see someone get both ends of those games. So. Uh, Yeah, a good one to check up on. Uh, A couple heavy hitters that we also got some updates on. Uh, Jack Hughes and Adam Fox both announced to be week to week. Um, So we'll have to keep an eye on that, obviously. Um, 
a head injury uh, or sorry, an upper body injury uh, for Jack Hughes. I'm not 100 percent sure it's a head injury, but uh, I was under the impression that he might have been called off the ice by the spotters. Um, and then uh, Adam Fox also listed as week to week. Uh, in Fox's place, uh, Gustafson, who we talked about on Thursday and I believe came up on the mega show on Sunday, uh, four points in two games, and he may have gotten another one. I don't know if that one was counted when I saw the tweet or not, um, but obviously, you know, really off to a great start. He was a guy, again, who who handled things pretty well, quarterback in the power play uh, in Washington when there was that injury to John Carlson. Uh, so definitely a guy, if he's still lingering around on your wire, I would be grabbing him because a couple weeks at the head of that lethal power play that really um, did some unspeakable things to the Red Wings today. Uh, I think that is always going to be something that is valuable for you. So that's definitely one to keep in mind. Uh, and then we got a surprise uh, player who was not on the ice for warmups out in Long Island. Uh, give us the update there, Jeremy. Well, there really isn't much of an update. Uh, best I can find is that Bo Horvat is out with a lower body injury. He did pop up as day-to-day yesterday, so there was a little bit of warning, but it kind of sounded like he may give it a go today. But he's out, and there is no news on the severity of the injury. I did not catch what they did with lines. I'm generally not interested in Islander players as uh, one-off replacements anyway. So maybe maybe you know who's up in his spot for a game or two? I don't know who took his spot, but I do know, kind of like you said, I think with Horvat out, it's definitely one of those situations where everyone is hurt more than they are helped. Um, also not especially interested in who gets elevated to that spot, although game day tweets uh, would be obviously a good source for that once, um, you know, to find out who filled in. Uh, I worry a little bit about Barzal because, you know, having Horvat as the shooter for him to dish to, obviously is huge for him. It's just a game or two, not so worried about it. Um, but they could have used the offense today uh, as Minnesota has taken a pretty commanding two-goal lead uh, in their matchup. So, uh, yeah, just something to keep an eye on. And uh, we can update you on Thursday's show uh, about what might be up with Horvat. Uh, now we got some outcheries. Uh, Sean Couturier returns here on Tuesday night uh, to his usual line one power play one duties versus the Sharks. Obviously great to get him in if you can. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my opponent this week was able to put him back in the line for tonight's game versus the Sharks. So uh, hopefully I can siphon off some points by uh, having Scotty Lawton in. But yeah, he's got Couturier. I would much rather have him because uh, that's going to be a big minute muncher in San Jose. Yeah, they, uh, they make every team look great. Um, we also have some outcheries. Uh, I like your little note here. I didn't notice it until just now. Uh, why don't I let you take this one since since you clearly wrote this up? Uh, yeah, this is the outchery Do We Care edition. Uh, Adam Ruzica on Calgary and Robbie Fabry in Detroit are both back. Ruzica looked decent earlier this year, but he's still just a middle six, maybe even fourth line piece for Calgary. I don't have much interest there. Robbie Fabry is one of those guys that I keep always going back to every year. I'm like, oh, he's playing second line wing for a new team. This is the year. And I think I'm just burnt out. Uh, He looks like he played about 13 minutes today, but minus two, uh, a missed shot, a block shot. Yeah, there's nothing else. Nothing else for Fabry. You know, he's a guy who, you know, I think is useful for the Red Wings to have. You know, they they have not had a ton of depth, and I think it's great to have him back. But, uh, yeah, more of a supporting figure unless he gets moved up into a higher slot moving forward. All right, let's go ahead and head into a short break here. Thanks, everybody, for, for sticking along with us. We'll see you on the other side. You're listening to Short Shifts. Welcome back to Short Shifts. Uh, want to talk about one of the hottest teams you know this is kind of one of the fun surprises this year the vancouver canucks have just been outstanding um you know they've really been excellent this season a big surprise along with um i think the other kind of big stories were edmonton struggles maybe the scorching start to detroit's power play although uh, that obviously has has not held uh the bruins really not missing a beat with their top two centers retired all great stories this year but love to see some success for the canucks 
Um, Brock Besser, I know he got talked about uh, on the Halloween episode that you and Shams did, um, but he's just really stood out as a huge success story. We've been waiting for him to kind of refine his game. Obviously, he's been through a lot of personal stuff, so uh, you know it's nice to see him getting you know back in the swing. Uh, he his couple ADP was one eighty eight, and yet he has been held without a point in just three of the Canucks twelve games. He's up to fifteen points in twelve games on the season, including six points in the last four games, and is ranked fifteenth overall in cupful scoring. That's the Keeping Carlson Ultimate Patron Fantasy League. Uh, listen, he's obviously overperforming. He's shooting twenty eight percent. His team's shooting 11.5% when he's on the ice. Um, but a silver lining, he, I noticed he doesn't have a single secondary assist. You know, that's always a way to sort of see if you think someone's going to regress on their point scoring. Um, so a drop in shooting percent that we should certainly expect uh, could at least be slightly mitigated by lucking into a few more of those secondary assists. And he certainly seems locked into that kind of line one, a or line one B, depending on how you feel about Pedersen, uh, with JT Miller and Paul DiGiuseppe, good Michigan boy there. Uh, so, you know, uh, this was interesting because I know Brian was trying to get involved in a trade for him. With this overperformance, are you looking at him as someone you want to try and trade and sell high on? Or do you just look at the Canucks and say, hey, here's a here's an offensive success story. Should we just sit there and, and enjoy the ride? I would absolutely be looking to sell high on Besser. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think he is going to be worth holding the rest of the season. I do think he's more of a 70-point pace guy than a 100-plus point pace guy as he's currently on. Uh, his his big boost has been on his power play time this year compared to last year, and I don't think that's going anywhere given the makeup of the Canucks roster. But if you can sell him for a struggling top 50 or top 70 guy, two guys that come to mind because we were recently discussing them in our little short shifts chat would be Pavel Buchnevich or Nikolai Ehlers. If you can sell high on Besser and get someone of those guys back, I think I would take Buchnevich or Ehlers over Besser. What would you do there? Interesting. I'm going to disagree with you. I don't love Buchnevich and 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 uh, what was the other one you mentioned? Sorry, Ehlers. Oh, Ehlers. I I just I, I worry about some of that. You know, are the Blues going to find their footing? Will Ehlers ever be a top line guy? Like, I don't know. I just don't love it. He's he's scoring so high. Like, what about maybe this is crazy? But what about like a Stamkos kind of guy who is you know maybe you know his his line mates have moved around a lot. They haven't been great. Um, you know, he has 12 points in 10 games, so he's also, you know, doing a pretty nice job, but, you know, uh, 50, 60 spots basically below Besser in the, um, in the cupful rankings. That is, I mean, if I'm going to, if I'm going to shoot my shot with a guy who is that hot right now, I think that I would rather go for broke and try to get someone like a Stamkos kind of guy rather than say, well, here's a guy who's not really performing and hopefully he can make it, you know, hopefully he can get back and, and find his footing. That just scares me a little bit because I feel like right now I've got a sure-ish thing. And if he's just on a 70-point pace for the rest of the season, based on what he's given me already, uh, I can live with the Stamkos owner telling me to, you know, uh, go take a long walk off a short pier. But I'm going to I'm gonna go for broke. And I think if, if yeah, if they say no, I'll survive, but I don't want to sell. I don't want to sell that low, I guess, because those guys just uh, too many red flags freak me out a little bit too much. That's, you know, that's my opinion. That makes sense. Uh, some other guys that may be closer to Stamkos in value that you could try to buy low on are Alex Tuck and Timo Meyer, although both of them have kind of turned it on a bit lately. I own both of them in Cupful and have gotten multiple offers for both of them, and I don't really have an interest in moving them for lower than their draft today value currently. But if you have Bezer, sure, target one of those guys, see if someone's tired of it. There's already someone in the chat saying they have Buchnevich and would absolutely trade them for Bezer. So maybe my original target was even too low. Well, you know, I think, uh, I think too, if, if we had time to sort of pour through everything, I put you on the spot there a little bit. So uh, don't sweat it too much. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, 
you know, aim, aim, aim high. And if somebody says, well, let's, let's sort of work your way down. But I like that Alex Tuck suggestion. That's a really interesting one. He seems to have, you know, resecured his spot. Um, yeah, I like those. I like those ideas. Uh, speaking of someone who has been coming up a lot in trade talks, let's go to Anaheim. Generally a great success story. I should have put them in there with the Canucks as one of the really exciting teams. That's, you know, kind of, finally kind of putting things together with all of their young talent. Uh, but Zegers has really struggled. Lots of questions on Twitter and in the Discord about him. One goal, one assist only in 11 games. Has taken 29 shots, kind of some Barrett Hayton vibes right now a little bit. Uh, still averaging 18 minutes a night, still deployed with Troy Terry, still getting the majority of power play minutes, uh, something that Hayton is starting to lose. So he's got to put it together soon. Um, you know, everything points to positive regression. Everything kind of points to a buy low on him. He's shooting 3.4%. His on ice 5v5 shooting percent is somehow even worse at 2.7. He doesn't have his one assist as primary, not secondary. Like there it seems like a natural buy low, right? Is this so many people should be going out and dropping offers for? I am absolutely dropping offers for Zgress, assuming that you see him as what he was last year and not some sort of breakout candidate. He's actually a really interesting case because he is approaching his 200th game in the NHL. And that's generally considered the quote unquote breakout threshold where after 200 games, a guy is who he is. And Zegris just hasn't made that leap into superstardom that someone like Jack Hughes did and that we may actually be seeing from Mason McTavish, his teammate, but I don't want to sidetrack too much. If Zegris is a future superstar, he's got to show it this year, I think. What do you think? So I, I you know, I think I'm actually glad you brought up um, how McTavish is doing because it almost feels like, a, a, like I said, everything points to a buy low. And I think I do have some guys that I might be willing to kind of send out there and see if I can't. Uh, make that kind of exchange. One thing that I worry about Zegris, and maybe this is crazy, but I, you know, we've talked a lot about having the guy on a team, right? And I think Zegris has the talent to be the guy, but he's got other guys who are emerging around him. And I sort of feel like, you know, and, and maybe he was never the guy, but it was at least half of the guy when he was teamed up with Troy Terry. But I feel like he may not have to be relied upon quite as much with the production that we're seeing from other pieces in the Ducks lineup, which is maybe not something anyone sort of expected to see or say. Um, obviously, he's due. I, I just I'm hesitant a little bit more than I would be typically um, because I do feel like he might not be relied on as heavily. I can see a world where he might potentially get shifted down in the lineup. Um, and when that's the case, it always makes me a little more kind of concerned uh, than I am typically. I would love to see, I was thinking about this, like who on my roster might I offer uh, the Zegris owner? Um, and one person who kind of stood out was Ryan Hartman. I might like to see him move back up the lineup and produce a little bit before I think I would be trying to make that deal so that the, the Zegris person wouldn't just, you know, kind of throw it back in my face. But, you know, um, I'm looking at, at Hartman. He's 57th overall in Kukupful, unsustainable shooting, seven goals on 29 shots. He had that huge three goal game uh, back on the 24th against Edmonton uh, in October, I should say. Um, so, you know, maybe I'd be willing to offer someone like that. I get just so nervous about someone who is underperforming. Obviously, he's going to improve, but is he going to be able to, you know, kind of climb out of the muck uh, from what he's been producing so far? So I think I set myself up to say, yeah, this guy is awesome and you should definitely offer him. But I just am. You know, how how when he thaws, will he thaw fully? Will he come back? to be what we think he can be, or is he in a bit more of a timeshare situation with the the increased talent that the Ducks have? Let me throw one at you. If you're talking about guys on your roster, you would offer for Zegris. Would you offer Vladimir Tarasenko for Zegris, or do you rather Tarasenko? I think I'd rather so keep I, Tarasenko. Ah, that's an interesting one. I think I would offer. I think I would make that offer. My concern is that 
Tarasenko, if he's really going to be shifted down as far as he has been at times, like where, when are the Senators going to have the center depth to really support their wingers the way that you would like to? Um, he had some nice, uh, he had some nice production, I think, for a while with Ridley Gregg, for instance. But I mean, he's hurt. You know, Josh Norris. I mean, hopefully, will stay fine for a while. But he is always, you know, just a one hard exhale away from an injury. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think I think I would make that offer. I kind of like that idea. Maybe and certainly, like tonight. based on where they were drafted, yeah, I would go for it. I kind of like that. Yeah, make it before the show comes out. I would say. Um, all right, we got to move on. Zeke is really interesting, but we got a couple more people we want to talk to. Uh, another cold streak. Um, this is uh, a guy that we've talked about a little bit, uh, Jonas Johansson, uh, aka JoJo. Uh, after four quality starts in a row and two shutouts, he's really struggled in his last two outings, uh, posting 857 and 818 save percentages. The latter was his first really bad start of the season. Um, I wonder a little bit if, um, you know, things kind of turned for uh, Matt Tompkins in the second half of their game tonight, uh, Tuesday night here against um, against uh, Montreal. Kind of the same story that we saw yesterday when Montreal went up four to one and then gave it all back. Uh, this time they were up four to nothing at one point and the game ended five to three. So not ideal for Tompkins, but I wonder if he might even get another start uh, later in the week, just because, you know, that's the second night of the back to back. The previous game went to overtime. Uh, I wonder if that might be an opportunity for him. Um, Vasilevsky is expected to return in late November, sometime around American Thanksgiving. Uh, so the benefit of holding on to him shrinks every day. And I'm kind of looking for an off ramp. Uh, and in fact, he was the guy that I ended up dropping to get Scotty Tulati in tonight, uh, just because I feel like, you know, like I said, any stream against the uh, any stream against the Sharks could be, you know, worth two streams uh, or two games uh, against any other team. So uh, I did finally let him go. I do have two other starting quality goalies, uh, although Vili Huso barely managed to crawl back into the positives today. I've got Tristan Jari too. Um, so, you know, I was ready to go back down to two goalies and now seemed like the time to do it in this very tight match against a great team in my division. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what I ended up doing. I know, um, we've been talking about him quite a bit, but hitting a bit of a cold streak. And I wonder if Matt Tompkins gets a little bit of a longer look, you know, there's no, there's no particular reason why the lightning need to be particularly loyal to, uh, to Johansson, especially with, um, Vasilevsky coming back. That's a, a bit bold for me. I I just like the volume that Johansson has been getting, both in number of starts and number of shots in every start. Even yesterday's game, he gave up five goals and took the loss in overtime and still had a positive outcome, which it's kind of hard to give up five goals and not be negative. I think he did end up just barely negative after the sixth goal, that overtime game winner. I think he ended up at negative 1.2 uh, in Kakupful, but obviously it depends on your league settings too. Good good catch. I, I'm i still holding him for basically until I can't fit him in my lineup. If I'm running three goalies and I look at a week, like I've got him in a league where all three of my goalies play Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday next week, and I'm like, am I really going to drop Johansson? But also one of my other goalies is Merzlikens, who also kind of sucks. So I, I have to make that decision by the end of this week. And like you said, if Vasilevsky is back by American Thanksgiving, Vasilevsky will at least play half of the games. I do see a scenario where for the month of December, they kind of roll them 50-50 to be careful with their $10 million goalie. But a 50-50 Johansson is worth almost nothing. So I'd be ditching him as soon as Vasilevsky is activated from IR for sure, maybe sooner. All right. Well, you're making me feel a little better because that my thinking was I've got the three goalies. They're all playing those two Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday games. So uh, our, our reasoning lines up, even if the timing doesn't necessarily fit. All right. And a couple hot players here. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about Matias Michelli down in Arizona? Although you wouldn't guess it based on his cuckupful points per game, 
Matias Michelli is on an eight-game point streak in which he has nine points. It actually is a nine-game point streak in which he has ten points because he scored a goal against the Kraken six minutes into the game today, and that game is still in the first period. Michelli, though, is, I believe you said that he's the new Robert Thomas, and I said he's the new Nicholas Backstrom, and I need to update my comparisons because people may not know what Backstrom was like to own in fantasy during his prime. He's assists heavy, doesn't shoot a lot, doesn't score a lot of goals, not a ton of peripherals. So all of a sudden, he's getting an assist and a shot for three and a half cupful points every game. Believe it or not, that's not worth owning. I like Michelli as a player. I just think he's a kind of worthless fantasy asset because if he's doing this on a nine-game point streak, what else is he going to do? Yeah, Shams was giving us the rundown on like all of the one assist, one shot per game guys. He brought up Nick Bugstad, John Marino, just was nailing it with all of these guys on these long streaks. Uh, you know, of course, leave it to Shams to, uh, you know, be able to dazzle us even when he's not on the show. But yeah, I think that's a really great point. And you've got to look at those average points. If they're averaging under four, that's not a forward that's probably worth having. Obviously, you want to know within your own uh, within your own league settings. But yeah, whenever I'm looking at you know who I want to add, I'm looking at that season average or last 14 days average, kind of depending on on who it is. So I think that is really helpful. One last hot streak guy I want to cram in here at the end of the show before we go. Uh, Tommy Novak has been really hot, seven points in the last six games, and he's played above his season average time on ice in five of those six games. That's something that I always want to look for. I love to see younger players getting leaned on more heavily, getting more opportunity, gaining their coach's trust. So I think that's a very positive development. The power play, time on ice, and the shots have been wacky. He has fluctuated in power play time from as low as 21% to as high as 80%. Uh, and two, zero, zero, two, five, and two shots in the games during this streak. So it really seems like a gamble. Um, I'm not saying you should rush out to grab him, but he's a guy to keep an eye on. The reason I don't love him is because Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday schedule this week. Next week, just Tuesday, Saturday. So, yeah, look at him as a watch lister guy, not somebody that you want to run out and grab unless you're going to have room in your lineup on those days. But he looks like a guy who is kind of finding his footing at the NHL level. Um, obviously, not a ton of depth for uh, Nashville these days. So I think he's a guy that they're going to lean on. Uh, so maybe someone that you look at for later in the season when your your schedule opens up a little bit. Jeremy, we uh, we covered a ton today. That was really fun. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, it was a pretty fast shift, actually, by our standards. So we got a lot of material yeah, in a going, short amount of time. I have been going way long lately. Um, I do want to say I apologize a little bit uh, if the quality is not up to our usually sta usual standards. Uh, my good mic got busted just a few minutes before the show started. So I'll try and sound like my usual clear self when I rejoin you on Thursday. And uh, with that, Thank you, everyone, for joining us. The patrons uh, in the Discord chat, uh, you know, uh, going live. Great to see all of you. Uh, please give us a follow at Short Shifts KK. Brian and Elon can be found at Keeping Carlson. Uh, you can use GameDayTweets.com to get all the best information from Twitter without having to slog through the rest of Twitter, uh, including team by team and searchable tweets by player name. Uh, please visit that site and the other sites we research our episodes with at Yahoo, Frozen Tools, ShiftChart.com, Icy Data, and Natural Stat Trick. Our intro and outro music was created by Pat Roach. John Reed is our digital media producer. And until we see you next time, play smart and keep your shifts short.